It's hard to go anywhere these days without seeing the shape, or rather the face, of Michael Myers. That terrifying blank slate is everywhere from plushies to Christmas ornaments to underwear. Trust me, there's even more bizarre merch out there. See anything you like? It's a Friday afternoon in 1981. You're sitting impatiently in class, roughly sketching a cool S on your binder next to the Van Halen symbol you had worked on shading most of the year. Your nights have been less than restful ever since MTV debuted. There's about 30 minutes left of class, and all you can think of is meeting up with your friends and listening to Def Leppard on your way to the arcade. The only priority you have is trying to beat RRD's high score on Galaga. Last night, your friends tried to pull a fast one on you, trying to spoil the twist from the new Michael Myers movie. But what they didn't know is that you were at the midnight showing when it came out. On today's episode of 80s Horror Memories, let's go back in time a bit to see why Halloween 2 made Michael Myers a slasher icon. John Carpenter's, and very much also Deborah Hill's, Halloween easily traumatized a generation and then some in 1978. Most of America had not seen anything like this since the antics of Norman Bates in 1960's Psycho. Halloween exposed a new audience to slashers, giving them a new set of fears. However, something just hadn't quite clicked yet. Carpenter thought Halloween was a fluke. He, as well as the original team involved, thought that there was no way to build on what had been created. Why tarnish something that is so devilishly original with subsequent films that may not live up to it? What's hilarious about Carpenter's modesty is that as soon as Halloween was released, it blew up. The thought process then became, Halloween is making a lot of money, let's rip it off. So that's what every director, writer, and producer did as quickly as they possibly could. In fact, that's exactly how Friday the 13th happened. Instead of going the route of subtlety, director Sean S. Cunningham wanted more shock and awe, which after its release led to every slasher amping up the gore factor and changing the horror landscape forever. What I seem to remember the most is that that was the, it seemed to be the era of horror film that brought us all of our standard tropes of one killer, not always explained why, going after a bunch of teenagers in the woods one at a time. Um, and that is fr from that has spawned fandom and mockery and all of its gorgeous. Right? Hill and Carpenter thought they were completely done with Halloween after it came out. In fact, Hill actually gave Dick Warlock the Myers mask and said, we're never going to do another movie with him. Carpenter had to be coaxed to even entertain the thought with the promise that he could make his next film, The Fog. I think I'll go to Vancouver now. Well, the coaxing didn't work, but getting sued when you go with a rival film company for your next film does. Carpenter settled the suit by making a commitment to do the thing that he had resisted up until that point. Halloween 2. Damn you. What have you done? I haven't done anything. You let him out! He accepted his fate, sat down with a six-pack of beer, and reluctantly began to dig in. On All Hallows' Eve in 1981, Michael Myers returned to finish the job he started. Halloween 2 picks up right where Halloween leaves off. The movie starts about five minutes after the events of the first one. We see Lori being brought out of the house on a gurney, and the authorities are there to pick up Michael. Except that Michael has disappeared. While producer Erwin Yablons devised the babysitter versus boogeyman idea, the look and origin of Michael Myers is born from an experience that Carpenter had when he was in college. Michael comes from a very real place. In Cut Above the Rest, Carpenter gives an account of when he went with his class to a mental institution. As they're touring the halls, he is suddenly struck by a young patient. 
His thoughts not only wind up creating one of the most iconic characters of all time, but also the iconic speech given by Loomis. Even the most rudimentary sense of life or death, of, of good or evil, right or wrong. To bring this vision to life, the idea was to get a mask that was a blank face, featureless and pale, basically the face mask from Eyes Without a Face. When Tommy Lee Wallace, the production designer, went on the errand to retrieve a mask, he grabbed a clown mask and a Captain Kirk mask. Wallace said that in mask form, the Shatner mask was featureless. He made a few modifications like cutting the eye holes larger and removing the eyebrows. These simple decisions turned out to be legendary. After the movie premiered, kids and adults alike could not wait to get their own mask. One of my core memories from around 1989 was sitting in our living room at the tender age of five and suddenly hearing the Halloween theme. When I turned around to our small CRT TV, Halloween was playing. I ended up sitting there staring at the television, unable to take my eyes off of what I was seeing. A few days later, we went to a haunted house that was put together by the local high school. And within a minute of walking in, I was confronted by someone wearing a Michael Myers mask. All I remember after that is running out screaming and crying. Hello, help me! Man, please help me! Please! Needless to say, I did not go back to any haunted houses for some time, thanks to the impression that Halloween had made on me. Michael felt real at that point, and could be anywhere that I was. Uh, what those movies bought us is... Uh, if you smoke and drink, you're gonna die. If you have sex before marriage, you're gonna die. If you bully other kids, you're gonna die. Uh, but, <laughs> but if you're wholesome and righteous, you might make it to the end. And then the killer might, may or may not be really defeated because you always wanna make a sequel. So there's always like, dun, 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 he's still alive. <laughs> so uh, I think that, yeah, potential for sequels also happened in the 80s. Uh, endings weren't always the end. Uh, I, I found that to be quite uh, uh, disturbing because I, I like things wrapped up at the end, but it's like, no, oh, there's, a, there's more? Oh, he's not dead yet. He really should be dead. While the birth of Michael may have been based on a brief encounter with a tiny psycho, there are certainly roots that go back to the serial killer boom of the 1970s. It's been said that people who watch horror are just mentally preparing themselves to be scared in a safe environment. There was an odd comfort in watching a big screen boogeyman over one in their own backyard. One of my core memories, and I'm sure it is for a lot of kids of the 1980s, was the PSA, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? While this was originally a gentle reminder for parents of the 60s to check on their kids, it also rings true for the decade of decadence. Pre-internet and pre-cell phones, there was really no way to locate where anyone was. As a kid, you could take off on your bike, and your mom would just yell at you to be home before dark. While the idea of a boogeyman lurking in your own hometown was not trauma-inducing enough, Halloween 2 went into another sacred place, the hospital. We watched Lori leave her bed, creeping slowly down the halls, while unbeknownst to her that Michael has already made it to her. The audience leaves the theater with a new fear of a familiar place. All right, listen, um, why don't you check the east wing again, all right? What the first Halloween does for the suspense and tension of the franchise, Halloween 2 elevates that with brutal kills and cements Michael as an indestructible force to be reckoned with. We do get our slow burn moments sprinkled throughout the movie, but those are also balanced with some of the gnarliest kills that we were not expecting. The horror audience gets it when you're telling them a good story. Uh, if you just think it's a slasher picture, 
I don't think you move people because you don't care about the characters, you don't care about the situation, you don't care. You don't have to preach. You can just, just write good stories. Not only does Michael cement his status because of the carnage and upping his kill count, but he also uses a variety of weapons and makes his kills even more elaborate. There's also a shift when it comes to the Michael we first met, who now not only enjoys stalking his prey, but also thoroughly enjoys his kills. What's the count? Ten. So far. As a younger kid in the 80s, several slasher icons had already been firmly established well before anyone knew it, which meant I had already seen some things. When Halloween 2 came out, I was not expecting to see Michael not only stab a victim once, but over and over again. Then the hits just kept coming, no pun intended. One of my favorite moments is the bus explosion. At the time, I had no idea that it wasn't Michael who was trapped between that van and the car burning alive. I remember immediately thinking of the haunted house moment and shuddering, but it's also so kick-ass that you just run through the gamut of emotions. When I say that Halloween 2 has gnarly kills, I'm not being modest. At least one of you has been affected by the following scenes. The hot tub rendezvous, the syringe to the temple, the scalpel stabbing. I have a baseball card of this, if that's not weird. Or even the IV blood drain. I've seen a ton of horror flicks, and these moments have stayed with me. I can never pick which one of these is the best, as it always changes. The hot tub definitely seemed to have the most hype around it, as they were talking it up big time on the set. It's the one that I tend to hear about the most, whether it's in documentaries or even amongst the fans. The last 20 or so minutes of the movie really try to take Michael down, which seems nearly impossible, because it is. I mean, Dr. Loomis shot Michael six times before he actually fell to the floor. Six times! Loomis already knew he wasn't dead. Get away from him! He stopped breathing! No! At the time, Lori is able to set Michael on fire and just watching him bust through the door on fire is definitely high art. And we see him fall to the floor, again with our ending moment being a close-up of his mask burning. Most of us want to believe that he's gone, but we know in the back of our heads that it's going to take a hell of a lot more than that. It may take a time machine to just make sure he's a race from existence, because at this point, we have no idea how to get rid of him successfully. Because evil never dies. He is an apex predator. When he surfaces, there will be no pause. There will be no empathy. Dr. Lomas, I think there's something else you should know. Here comes the real bomb, though. The one little piece of backstory that changes Halloween forever. In the car on the way over to the hospital, Marion tells Dr. Loomis that after unsealing Michael's file, it was revealed that Lori is Michael's little sister, born two years before Michael was committed and was adopted by the Strodes two years after her parents died. Myers has already killed one sister and is now after the other. His motivation for going after Lori is revealed, and Michael is no longer just a mindless killer. This polarized fans. It's his sister? That girl, that Strode girl, that's Michael Myers' sister. As a fan, you either feel like this is the stupidest decision ever made, or the best twist that you didn't see coming. What's interesting, though, is the shift in motivation. At first, Michael has no rhyme or reason to do what he does. You can certainly argue, as I know many fans do, that this alone is why he is so terrifying. However, the sister angle got people talking, good or bad. And that's good business in showbiz. Well, you know, the funny thing is that, you know, when you make any movie, you make the best film you can, 
as, as well as you can, as true to the material as you can, but you never know whether it's gonna stand the test of time. It's impossible to know. Um, so it's nice that some of these movies have, that t even today, have, have kind of stood the test of time and our instincts are right. Honestly, we could buzz back and forth about how much the story shifts, and we would absolutely lose our minds and throw the whole damn book out. Halloween seems to be up for interpretation for whoever is making it, which somehow also throws off what's considered canon and what's not. The point here goes back to what I originally said. The controversial decision only gave Michael a boost, which would be a massive reason why removing him from the third film put people into a spiral. They started off strong with an immediately iconic villain, then moved to super slasher territory blowing the roof off the house, all to pull it back with a full stop. Well, I think it did what, what John always meant to do with the Halloween movies, which was have a seasonal film that didn't always tell the same story. And Tommy Lee Wallace did a great job with that. And uh, I'm glad that it's getting its due now. Uh, a lot of films are like that. People expect something, they get pissed off. It's like, uh, you know, I call it the fascism of the fandom. but. Uh, you know, he took a big hit just because Michael Myers wasn't in it. And the film holds up on its own as a great, scary Halloween film. By the time this third movie hits, all fans are desperate for another go with Myers. It's one of the many complaints of Halloween 3's biggest foe, Joe Bob Briggs. Where's the slasher? Where's Michael Myers? At the end of the day, the absence of Michael Myers only brought an anticipation and longing for the character. It allowed his character to maintain a sense of enigma and made his appearances all the more impactful. Carpenter called this film an abomination. He was brought in later to retool the ending that Rosenthal had crafted, as it was not scary enough. Personally, I think Rosenthal and a reluctant Carpenter both brought elements to the film that make it as great of a sequel as it is. Or at least that's the opinion I'm sticking with. Regardless how you feel about it, choose your own adventure, canon or not. Halloween 2 catapulted Michael Myers to the slasher icon that he is today. On the next episode, it's time to pack your bags and let's head deep into the Tennessee woods because when it comes to demonic forces, there is no better place than a remote cabin with you and your friends. Just be wary of the book you may find in the cellar because you just may unleash the evil dead. Until next time, gore hounds. <laughs>